I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today we are finishing up our two-part mini-series entitled Unforgiveness. Now, this message today, part two, is entitled The Joy of Forgiveness. Last week we spoke about the merciless servant in part one. In that message, we looked at how the servant had built up this huge, huge debt. A debt so big that he was unable to repay it. So the master of that servant, the king, felt pity for his servant because he begged him for mercy. So he, 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 he hit on that cord for the king and the king felt pity for him. He extended mercy to him. He said, okay, I forgive your debt. Your debt is now canceled. That same servant, after being forgiven a debt somewhere in her vicinity of $23 billion, went out that same day and found one of his fellow servants who only owed him somewhere in the vicinity maximum of $45,000 by today's standards. Now that doesn't even begin to compare to the $23 billion that he had owed. But he didn't think about that. He ran up to his fellow servant, caught him by the throat, and began to strangle him and demand that he pay back the debt he owed right then and right there. His fellow servant, of course, was unable to pay, just like he was un unable to pay. But instead of paying it forward and forgiving his fellow servant and showing him, extending to him the same merciful, forgiven treatment that he himself had begged for and had received, he threw him in prison until his debt was repaid. The master of that servant heard all that had happened and he called him in and he demanded payment. He had rescinded his former decision of forgiving that debt. He said, I want you to pay that $23 billion and I want you to pay it now. He said, I'm not able to pay it. Please forgive me. He said, no, I will not forgive you. You would not forgive your fellow servant $45,000, but you want me to forgive you $23 billion? I will not. And he threw him in prison until he was able to pay. And Jesus said, he ended the parable with this. The same thing will happen to every one of you who do not forgive from his heart. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that statement later on in our message. But now, today's message, the joy of forgiving. Turn with me please to Colossians chapter three, verse 12 through 17. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if one has it complete against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Listen to what Paul is saying. He is saying in Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, that we are God's holy and beloved chosen. We, the church, we, the redeemed, his blood-bought ones, must put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now that we have clothed ourselves with these traits, we must bear with one another. That the word means continually bear and endure. In other words, it means to put up with something to, or put up with someone as not to extract punishment or demand recompense. Not once and your obligation then is completed, not twice and your obligation is completed, but rather you must bear continually with that person. 
Then it goes on to say in verse 13, Bear with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must, 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 must forgive. We are each required to forgive one another without being asked. If It says, if you have a complaint against another person, then forgive that person. It does not have to be that that person comes to you because you had a big falling out and now everybody on social media knows about it. And that person is now asking you, please forgive me so that everybody can see that you all have now made up and you have forgiven them. It doesn't have to be like that. Not at all. They don't even need to ask you. You just need to forgive. Forgive the trespass. Because Christ has forgiven you your debts. I want us to take a look at what Jesus taught on the subject. Mark chapter 11 verse 25. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Paul was only echoing what Jesus had already taught. From the way that it is translated, it seems to me that God is patiently waiting for us to forgive others so that he can now forgive us. Jesus said, forgive so that your Father in heaven may forgive you. What is hindering our forgiveness? It is our lack of forgiving others. I want you to watch this. Jesus is inferring that unforgiveness is not only a precursor to our, un, our, our forgiveness, but it seems to be a hindrance to our prayers as well. See what Jesus said? Look at it. When you stand praying, when you stand praying, that word stand is a strong word, meaning continue to be. In other words, when you continue to be in prayer, not just this three-minute prayer, not just some arrow prayer, Lord, bless me and bless my family, and then you push on to work. No, when you continuously petition day and night and nothing is happening, check your forgiveness gauge. The Holy Spirit will bring it to mind. Whatever is hindering that prayer, the, the, the Holy Spirit will remind you of that person. He will bring that person's name to you. And when it comes to your mind... Jesus said, when you remember, forgive. They don't have to come and ask you. They don't have to deserve it. Just forgive so that your prayers may be answered. God is not going to answer your prayer if you're harboring unforgiveness in your heart. He's not going to do it. You must first get rid of that unforgiveness so that God can forgive you and then answer your prayer. Remember in our last message, I told you the story about a woman who would rather go to hell than to forgive those who has caused her such pain and caused her such heartache. Well, here's the rest of her story. Our youngest daughter, Ari, wrote a seven-day devotional on forgiveness. The devotional was geared specifically to that woman. After reading the devotional, she forgave those who had hurt her. She was set free in her spirit. The burden of forgiveness was lifted. Her relationship with her family was repaired. And she began to want more out of life than just revenge. She used to live for revenge. She didn't care what it costed. She wanted to exact revenge on those people who had hurt her. She wanted them to pay even more than she had hurt. The Mayo Clinic said that holding on to past hurts and nursing past wounds of some traumatic experience, whether it was emotional, physical, or some sexual abuse by someone close to you, someone you trusted, or even if it was maybe a colleague at work who sabotaged your project and made you look bad, made you look stupid in front of the boss and in front of your other colleagues, or whatever the case may be. Holding on to those hurts may cost you more dearly than it cost the ones who hurt you in the first place. Please understand that hurt can cause 
cause resentment and anger, which leads to bitterness and hatred. And then in the end, it leaves you physically, emotionally, and spiritually broken. The Mayo Clinic proposed that forgiving those who hurt you will open the door to peace and usher in hope into your life. Just like it did that woman who refused to forgive, but after reading the, the, the devotional, forgave. Peace was ushered into her life. Hope was ushered into her life. Her family was reunited. The Mayo Clinic said, forgiveness can lead you down the path of physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. What is that? That is the joy of forgiveness. Forgiveness does not mean that you completely forget the horrible, disgusting things that were done to you. It doesn't mean that you excuse the person for the wrongs they perpetrated against you. It doesn't mean that you understand why they did what they did to you. It doesn't even mean that you must now become besties. What it truly requires is this. An intentional decision to let go of resentment and anger. It has to be intentional. It's an intentional decision to release the person who has hurt you so deeply from their obligation to pay for what they did. To let go the desire for that person to hurt as badly as you hurt. You cannot say, I forgive you, when you're hoping and praying that they get their recompense, their knuppens. That is not the spirit of forgiveness. Forgiveness will be ushered in when you let go of the hate, when you let go of the rage that dwells within you, and the need for the revenge that you feel whenever that person's name is mentioned, or whenever those feelings are stirred up because they have walked into your view, because you saw them on the road, because you saw them somewhere, because they're having a good time and you only want bad for them. It triggers those feelings of hate, of animosity. I used to work with a woman when I was much younger. We're still friends today, and we've always been good friends since we started working together, but I used to jokingly tease her all the time. And I wasn't making fun of her or being mean or anything like that. It was just a playful teasing. In fact, I used to tease the whole office. But when I used to tease her, she would say, if he angers you, he has conquered you. And I always remember that because that is so true. You see, real hurt can anger you. And anger conquers you. It wraps another chain around you every time you walk down the memory lane on Heartbreak Street. It keeps control of you, and, or it puts control of you in the hand of the one who has caused you the pain in the first place. If you think about it, it is they who are now controlling your emotions. They're controlling when you're upset or when you're not. They're controlling your ups they're controlling your downs. They're controlling whether you're happy or whether you're angry, whether you're sad or whether everything's okay. They're controlling everything about you, whether you're having a good day or whether you're having a bad day. They're in control. So I advise my advice to you is to take back control of your own self and do not let someone else have that kind of control over you, that kind of control over your feelings. Take back control of your own self and of your own feelings and of your own emotions. When you begin to forgive, you will see an improvement in your own well-being. My clinic said, and I want to quote, Letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for improved health and peace of mind. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety, less stress, and less hostility. Fewer symptoms of depression, lower blood pressure, 
a stronger immune system, improved heart health, improved self-esteem, end of quote. So tell me, who would not want one or all of these things? Who, who does not desire to have joy in their life with lower? You don't have to be in blood pressure tablets because of unforgiveness. Forgive that person. One of the biggest problems with unforgiveness is that you hurt the ones that you love most. Your relationships are strained. Your relationship with your children, your relationship with your husband, your spouse, your wife is toxic. Those that are closest to you are the ones that you hurt because of unforgiveness because of the pain you're harboring in your soul. You will strike out most of the time unnoticingly, but you will strike out verbally or physically. You will abuse your own loved ones in proxy of the one who actually caused you the pain. And that is why the expression, hurt people hurt people. Remember the merciless servant from last week? Well, Jesus told the parable of the merciless servant to illustrate how the kingdom of God works. He said that this, if you want to do this, this is how the kingdom of God works. Here it is. And he ends the parable with, so also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Matthew chapter 18, verse 35. I say surprisingly, because Jesus was talking to Jewish men who grew up in Judaism. And if they knew nothing else, they knew two things. They knew their jobs, their livelihoods, and they knew the Torah. And they knew that the Torah taught an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, bruise for bruise, so shall it be rendered. You heard me? I hurt you. I have the right to hurt you the same way that you have hurt me. I have that right because the law of Moses has given me that right. I will hurt you back if you hurt me. Now Jesus comes along and he's saying, we must forgive one another. We must let bygones be bygones. We must forgive those that hurt us and pray for them who persecute us. What's going on here, Jesus? What are you talking about? I must forgive and love even my enemy. It says they hate my enemy, Jesus. You must have got it wrong. How can we forgive? But make no mistake, it was not just some nice suggestion that Jesus was suggesting. Jesus makes it very clear that if you're going to be a part of the kingdom of God, you must, you must, must, must forgive from the heart. He was not skinning up over that. He was not suggesting. He said, if you're going to be a part of this kingdom, there's a new law in town. And that is forgive. Even though you're hurt, even though you're broken, even though you don't, can't seem to find it in your heart to forgive those who have hurt you, still, you must forgive so that your heavenly father may forgive you. And Jesus said, not only that you must forgive, but you must forgive from the heart. That means that there must be a conscious commitment to forgive. It is an ongoing daily routine of recognizing the emotional wounds and hurts and how it affects your behavior and then remembering or being aware of the benefit of forgiving and your desire to improve your own well-being and secure your place in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, recognizing it is for your own good and your own well-being. It's not for the one who has hurt you. It's for you. Forgiveness. Oh, but Brother Kenny, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how they have hurt me. You have never felt this kind of pain. And what can I say? You're right. 
I have never felt the kind of pain that you have felt. I've never experienced the things that some of you have experienced. And Lord forbid that I ever will. But nonetheless, there are those who have. I want you to meet a woman by the name of Mary Johnson. Mary's only child, Lamarian Bird, was brutally murdered at the age of 20 years old by a 16-year-old O'Shea Israel. They got into an altercation at a party and egos clashed. And Mary Johnson's only child was taken out and thrown into eternity. Mary, being a Christian woman, thought she had forgiven O'Shea for the dastardly evil deed he had done. He had killed, he had murdered her only child. So to prove her conviction right, she decided to visit O'Shea in prison. And here is their story. Um, on February 12th, 1993, I received a call that no parent wants to receive. Hatred began when um, uh, and I found out um, who had taken Lorraine in his life. I think it started then. And uh, I was, I'm a Christian woman, and I was just full of hatred. I, I, I didn't like anybody at that time. I was mad and upset with everybody. Um, like I said, I viewed him as an animal when we started going to court and I just wanted him to be locked up for the rest of his life because I thought, hey, you know, you just shouldn't have done this to my child. And I just, I, it just hate just kept coming and coming and coming. You know, uh, uh, the more I'd go to court um, and the way things would go in court too, I, I, I don't know, I, I just hated everyone. I, even my family, they started off coming with me, but they didn't continue. After the trial, I got this two mothers poem, and it was about two angels in heaven, and because of the crown they wore, they both knew they were mothers here on earth. And so they were talking about their son. The one mother said, I would have taken my son's place on the cross if I could have. And the other mother fell on one knee, and uh, the mother of Christ, uh, no, no. No, the mother fell on one knee and she said, oh, you are she, the mother of Christ. So the mother of Christ lifted her, kissed a tear from her cheek and said, now tell me of your son so I may grieve with you. And she said, my son is Judas Iscariot. And the poem just ended there. And I read it the second time and I heard within myself, I want mothers to murder children and mothers of children that have taken life to come together and heal. I kept hearing this thing over and over and over and over. This is what you're to do. This is what you're to do. So I finally decided if I'm gonna do that, I need to go to prison and make sure that I have forgiven him. Because if I hadn't, there's no way I'll be able to deal with these mothers. Uh, I got halfway up the ramp and I broke down. I said, I can't do it. God, I am not ready. But I'm so thankful that he says he'll send us out two by two because Regina was behind me and she just pushed me up the ramp. And we got inside and I had to go clean up my face. Then we went through the metal detector. I had never been in prison before. Uh, him and I had shook hands and I told him, look, I don't know you. You don't know me. You didn't know my son and my son didn't know you. And I said, we need to lay a foundation. We need to get to know one another. This is a true story of true forgiveness. After O'Shea's release from prison in 2010, Mary convinced her landlord to let O'Shea lease the apartment right next door to hers. Only a wall now separates the two. Mary Johnson knows what it is like to hurt. Mary Johnson knows what it's like to grieve. Mary Johnson knows what it's like to lose her only child at the age of 20. He still had his whole life in front of him. But one night, wrong place, the wrong time. She knows what it's like to live in unforgiveness. But praise the Lord, she knows what it's like to finally forgive. And here's the lesson that Mary Johnson learned. 
This is what Mary said in another interview, and I want to quote her. Unforgiveness is like cancer. It will eat you from the inside out. It is not about that other person. Me forgiving him does not diminish what he's done. Yes, he murdered my son, but the forgiveness is for me. It's for me, end of quote. How can a mother forgive the murderer of her only child? The love of Jesus and nothing else. That is how she could do it. By the love of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God who gave his life and forgave those who were murdering him. He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Jesus, his love is the only way that we can forgive others. It is the love of Jesus that can change the hardest heart. It's only the love of Jesus who can change our heart. It's the love of Jesus that causes us to forgive those who we deem unforgivable. Those who we cannot ever think about forgiving. Because of Jesus, because of his love, we can forgive. And we must forgive. I want us now to bring our attention back to the last four verses of our scripture reading as we bring it in for a closing. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 through 17. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul said, above all, above all, put on love. Why? Because it is love that binds everything together in perfect harmony. Without love in our heart, it would be impossible for the peace of Christ to rule in our hearts. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in his first letter to them in this 13th chapter. He said, love does not keep record of wrongs. If love is reigning and ruling in your heart, and you're wearing love like an outer garment, you will not dwell on the wrongs done to you. It does not mean you won't have the scars. You will have the scars, but the wounds will heal. Jesus kept his scars. Jesus didn't get rid of his scars. He still has the scars, but his wounds were healed. The scars are the memories. We will never forget what was done to us. It won't just magically pop out of our minds, out of our memories. It would not magically be erased this side of eternity. But you know what? You're forgiven. They are forgiven. I understand that you've been through a lot. But thank God He has brought you through. Thank God He has restored you. Because God is love. Now look what Paul does. Paul goes on to say, be thankful. Three times in those last three verses, Paul admonishes his readers to be thankful. A thankful heart is a forgiven heart. Start being thankful and know the joy of forgiveness today. It will be like water to your soul. It will be like medicine to your bones. Forgive. Let the love of Christ reign in you. Let thankfulness overflow in your heart. In closing, I want to encourage you to put on love like a garment. Then I want you to fill your heart with thankfulness. Always, always rejoicing in the Lord. Never let the past 
take control of your future by wielding your emotions back and forth by causing your emotions to go high and then to go low causing you to be unstable causing you to be happy one moment sad the other let your heart be filled with thanksgiving for great things the Lord has done great things he has done for us he has redeemed your life from the pit be thankful he has given you eternal life be thankful Jesus is coming back to get us real soon be thankful we don't know when he's coming back but he but we know he is coming back and we are thankful you know I don't know if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior maybe you don't know Jesus but you would like to know him if that's you there's good news you can you can know Jesus today you can know that forgiveness that he offers you and you in turn can offer it to somebody else all you have to do is to ask how do you ask repeat this prayer after me Heavenly Father forgive me of my sins and help me to forgive others who have sinned against me help me to live a life portraying love portraying forgiveness that I might share in the joy of forgiving and that I might share it with others thank you Lord Jesus for dying on the cross and forgiving me I accept your eternal life now for it's in your name Jesus that I pray if you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Here's what I want you to do. Get your Bible. Read your Bible. You know what? While you're driving, you can also put on the Audible Bible. Listen to it. Saturate your soul. Saturate your mind. Saturate your heart with the Word of God. And then the love of Jesus will build up in you and it will be easier to forgive others. I want you then to join a Bible-believing church who believes that there's a right way and there's a wrong way, who believes that thus saith the Lord, who believes that the Holy Spirit still empowers His church. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. When, he, when Jesus comes back, He'll find you doing exactly what it is you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter into the joy of the Lord your Lord and you, you will you'll spend eternity with Jesus what a day of rejoicing that will be when you join up with those of your loved ones who has gone on before those of your loved ones who are saved and even those who have hurt you who have now have, have been saved by Jesus you'll all be reunited united in Christ and enjoy an eternity for all eternity Thank you, thank you so much for joining us. Jesus loves you, we love you. I'm Kenny Yates, be blessed and stay blessed.